G'day YouTube. Warbles on a lot here. For those of you who've been living underneath a rock, here's an update. Global industrial scale technological civilization has uh, come to a bit of a halt brought about by the discontent of a tribe of horseshoe bats that live somewhere around Wuhan in China. These horseshoe bats, they had a commensal relationship with a virus that didn't cause the bats any kind of a problem. But when some entrepreneurs some venture capitalists began treating these bats as merchantable livestock in what they call a wet market where some people bring in live animals and other people show up and buy them. We have a sort of a version of it here in Australia. It's, it's called the livestock market. Anybody who's got a cow or a sheep or a goat or a llama or an alpaca for sale. Takes it to the sale yards, puts it in a pen, everybody comes and has a look at it. They bid on it. Whoever wants to pay the highest price for the animal or pen of animals buys the animals and they take them away somewhere else and they either breed them or keep them or shear them or they kill them and they sell them through the butcher shops. So somebody decided to use bats as merchantable livestock in a wet market serving what they call the bushmeat trade in places where it's considered the height of fashion to eat something which was wild something not domesticated lo and behold somebody brought some bats to the wet market the bats which I am given to understand and I have no reason to disbelieve. They're so small that wingtip to wingtip they'd fit on one of my outstretched hands. Six, eight inches, tip to tip. They're an insectivorous bat. They're not a great big fruit bat. And they're not used as a main course they're used as garnishing on the edge of soup. They're paunched and they're deep fried. And the deep fried carcass of the little bat is hung on the edge of the soup bowl. So I'm told by a friend who says they saw a documentary on it. Okay, well, the horseshoe bats don't like being treated like that. Presumably during the paunching process, you know, you go and you buy your live bat and then the bat butcher kills and butchers the bat and gives them to you wrapped up in probably sterile plastic so you can go home feeling all sanitized. Somehow the virus got from inside the bat onto a thing called a pangolin. And a pangolin is sort of like an anteater version of a lizard that's got scales. And it's a kind of a rare and sacred animal in the rainforest in Asia. And the same people who are selling bats for bushmeat, they're also selling pangolin. So the pangolin then got infected with the bat virus. And then the pangolin managed to give the bat virus to the people. Okay. So do you know what the Australian Aboriginal story about bats is? Do you know why Australian Aborigines didn't eat bats? Would you be interested in knowing why Australian Aborigines did not eat bats? At least according to the white fella's black fella story that I read 
Oh, maybe back in 1969. It might be over 50 years old, this story. I encountered it in a book, which was in a box of books, which had belonged to my half-siblings, and the books were in a cupboard in the, the laundry. And when I had nothing else to do, I used to retreat to the laundry as a kid and have a look in the books. And, yeah, there was some books about Australian culture, probably pre-war or perhaps early World War II, before Japan got involved, when there were still such things being published in Australia. Early children's books. I have a sister who was born in 1939. I have a brother who was born in 1941. So yeah, that vintage child's book of explanations about Australiana. Stuff being published back in the days when Norman Lindsay was kind of at his pinnacle. A fading pinnacle because the magic pudding was a pre-World War I thing, but yeah, that was the style he inspired. So the story is, as I read it 50 or so years ago, that according to one of the 500 different Aboriginal language groups which lived across this land and had been living in their Tauri or traditional tribal homeland for at least 40,000 years. So say a Project DNA Nation, where they went and took DNA samples from people who were still living on their traditional lands and compared them to the DNA samples of people who'd been living there from the 1850s to about the 1950s, whose hair samples had been collected and preserved by various missionary outfits. And what they found was that the people who came to Australia 40,000 years ago found out, selected their traditional tribal homeland, and they stayed there. Two ice ages came and went, and the Australian Aborigines stayed on their traditional tribal homeland. They just adapted to the change. So anyway, back in the dream time, According to the Aboriginal legend, as I read it, in a book that was, you know, printed in Sydney. Wild native orchid. If you were really, really, really hungry, you could take the time to dig that fella up. And underneath it, there would be a bulb. And you could eat that bulb. Personally, I think I'll leave it there and hope that it grows prolifically. Lots of seed. Let's hope there's another one somewhere with which for it to breed. Okay, so back to the bats. Once upon a time, back in the dream time, there was a tribe of people and they looked at the birds and they were envious because the birds could fly and they thought that being down here on the ground was just boring. They wanted to fly and they looked at the seagulls soaring in the ridge lift and they looked at the wedge tails firmling out in the valleys and yeah, they wanted to fly big time. They wanted to fly. So they petitioned Biomi, right? This is not a rainbow serpent religious story. This is a Biomi story. Biomi, the creator God theory of the whole universe. Okay, this one tribe of Aborigines, they weren't happy with being bipedal naked monkeys. What they wanted to do, they weren't happy with the big thumbs either. What they wanted, they didn't know that though. They wanted to fly. So they petitioned Biomi, the creator God theory of the whole universe. And they said how dissatisfied they were with being stuck on the ground. And Biomi, the creator God theory of the whole universe, said to the people who weren't happy, I understand where you're coming from, but you don't know what you're asking. Oh, yeah, we do. Well, we know, we know. Well, we'll let us, let us, let us. And, and Biomi said, look, I can do it for you. 
If you want me to change you so you can fly, yeah, I can do that. But it's big change, radical change. I can only do it once and it only goes the one way. I can't bring you back from wanting to fly. If you want me to change you so you can fly, think long and hard because it's a one-way trip. All right, so the people who wanted to fly, they said to buy me there. Canel, canel, canoth, right? We want to do that. Change us so we're going to be able to fly. Well, by me said, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be quick. He said, you're going to have to go into that cave over there. And you're going to have to bed yourself down at the end of autumn. And you're going to sleep in the cave all through the winter. And you're not going to wake up. And when you wake up in springtime, then you're going to be able to fly. And after that, you're going to be the people who can fly. Not like birds, not with feathers. You're going to be the people who can fly. All right, so they did. And they woke up. And they weren't six foot tall and covered with, you know, feathers white gleaming in the sun. They didn't look like 18 foot wingspan wedge tails with opposable thumbs and shit like that. Oh no. No, they were some of them little tiny, you know, fit in the palm of your hand and the biggest of them. They wouldn't come up to knee height if they stood up on their back legs. Great big leathery wings. Nothing like a seagull, not like a wedge-tailed eagle, not even like a bloody gura gura gara gara. Not even like a one of them. Gura gura gara gara. Kookaburra. Yeah, so anyway. They weren't happy. Not a happy chappy. And they complained to buy me and buy me said you were warned. Get used to it. This is what you look like. You can fly. Enjoy it. You are the only mammals which can fly on the whole planet. Be happy. This is what you ask for. Be careful what you pray for because you're almost certain to get it. Okay, so the bats were so ashamed of how flaming ugly they looked that they decided that's it. They're going to hide inside their cave all night and they're only, all day, and they're only going to come out at night when nobody can see them, when nobody can laugh at them. And all of the rest of the humans here in the only continent that's left of Gondwana land, all the rest of the humans, ever since then they've looked on bats as like, you poor silly bastards, look what you've done to yourselves. Nobody has any reason to persecute bats because bats are already miserable enough. Look at them. They wanted to be seagulls. They wanted to be wedge tails. And they got to be these little leathery looking half ass tiny little baby monkey looking things. So no Australian Aborigines traditionally ate bats. It's just not the sort of thing that any self-respecting human being would do. And let's have a look, you know, what happens when you annoy the bats. Pretty sure there's a thing called a Hendra virus. Hendra virus comes about when somebody around the suburb of Hendra, on the outskirts of Brisbane in Queensland, in Australia, when somebody in Hendra has a few trees, one per paddock, where they keep their little racehorse fantasy or their pony club fantasy. And because it's the only tree left for miles around is the ones in the horse paddock, that's where the fruit bats who've been dispossessed by real estate agents and land developers and loggers, culling the rainforest. It's the only place where the bats can try and roost for the night. So they go and roost in the only trees that are left and that's what the horse fantasist calls their shade tree. So the horse fantasist has a feed trough and probably a water trough under the shade tree. 
which means the bat gets to shit on the horse food and then the horse gets to eat the bat shit and then the horse gets this thing called the Hendra virus. And when the horse has got this horrible runny nose and hacking cough and it's, it's obviously really sick, that's when the horse kisses go in and cuddle up to the horse and, you know, oh, poor Black Beauty, my fantasy, and they get it too. And a couple of them died. And all the vets who were involved in the turning horse industry, you know, turning horse, it's one of those hard-footed land lice. People pay money to make bets on which one of them is going to win a race, running around in a circle, going nowhere. Lots of money. The vet said they would not treat horses that had a respiratory infection unless somebody could come up with a vaccine. So the Australian Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organisation came up with a vaccine for the horses. Not for the people, for the horses. So if you want to get your sick horse treated by a vet, it's got to be vaccinated against Hendra virus. Right, well, the Congolese fruit bats, they had a different strategy entirely. They had this thing called Marburg virus, and then there was Ebola. And there were some really, really, really fucking super strong strains, which just wiped out the entire village and never got beyond the village because everybody died and nobody got to run far enough to spread it. And then you got the scenario where all of the bats were congregated heavily on one surviving tree and the entrepreneurs would gather with their four-wheel drives and their shotguns and their eskies and they would approach the tree from several directions and up at the top of the tree there were all the, you know, the young alert bats, the lookout bats. They'd see these four-wheel drives approaching, they'd warn the whole colony and most of the colony would fly away but the bats that were old and they were stressed and they were sick and their immune system was depressed they had succumbed to the various viruses that normally lived within them. So they were too tired to fly away. They'd stay where they were. And then the entrepreneurs would gather underneath the tree, which only had uh, one third the number of bats that you'd expect it to have. When you're looking at it with a telescope from the horizon. And they'd shotgun these bats and collect them in their eskies and they'd drive them to crossroads and they'd sell them to truck drivers who would take them into the nearest cities and sell them to restaurateurs. And that is how Ebola just keeps coming out of the Congo jungle. Bat eaters viruses. Well, behold, the Wuhan horseshoe bat. It also has a commensal virus, only the Wuhan horseshoe bat's commensal virus, it pretty much ticks every box that I was taught to worry about in, say, probably 1981 or 82, when, as a student nurse, they made me sit in a, a classroom and partake of a learning experience, including lectures in epidemiology and virology. And what they said was that the only thing that had kept the, quote, Spanish flu of 1917, 18, 1920 under control is the fact that there was no airliners. Back when the Spanish flu was the big problem, the fastest way around the world was on a boat. And the boat would have been powered by a coal or a diesel oil engine. And it would take you three months to get from Britain to Australia kind of thing, chug, 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 chug. It's a long way around the world. And when the boat shows up from the other side of the world and you've already got telegraphic news that there, there's, there's, there's a out of control respiratory virus or out of control respiratory pneumonia on the other side of the world, which at the time was called PUO, Pyrexia of Unknown Origin. Um, you can make a boat wait off the coast. You can, you can implement quarantine on a boat. You can wait until everybody on the boat has been well for 30 days before you let them loose on the shore. You can't do that with an airliner that's in the sky. So back in the early 1980s, 40 years ago, my lecturers 
at Repatriation General Hospital Concord were telling us that the one thing that the epidemiologists and the virologists and the respiratory physicians and everybody who knew what they were talking about was terrified of was the prospect of a new virus which spread droplet infection. And that's what the Wuhan horseshoe bat has come up with. Humanity finds itself confronted with a globally distributed droplet infective virus which is apparently highly contagious. You don't need much of it, you don't need much contact in order to contract it. The average time from being exposed to the virus to the onset of symptoms is 11.2 days if you experience symptoms. And 50% of the people who test positive to the virus on a respiratory swab, 50% of them are asymptomatic. Out of the remaining 50% who test positive, 18% of them need to be hospitalised. The rest either get a moderate case, not severe, severes need to be hospitalised, or a mild case. So if you allow for the idea that only half of the people who get infected get any idea that they're sick, you might say that only 9% of the population is going to get infected and need hospitalisation. But once they need hospitalisation, about half of them who go into hospital need to go into intensive care and about half of them die. And it turns out that if you're old and you've got other comorbidities, there is no point putting on you on a respirator because all that's going to do is cost $10,000 per day for three weeks and then you're going to die anyway. So this is apparently what happens when various human tribes far from Australia develop for themselves some kind of an intellectual rationalisation for doing something that goes diametrically opposed to the 40,000 year old wisdom of the 500 language groups that have lived here on Australia. Because what everybody who traditionally lived on Australia 251 years ago before Captain Cook showed up and approached the anniversary of the firing of the first shot in the frontier wars. Before Captain Cook showed up, nobody in Australia would have ever even vaguely considered eating a bat. Because everybody knew that the bats, they were just a tribe that had made a whole big mistake. They weren't fit to eat. They were more, well, to be pitied than to be persecuted. So there you go, and now you know. And it may be an entirely fictitious, romanticised 1930s, 40s, version of a childish white fella's black fella story. But as far as I know, that is the story. About why Australian Aborigines traditionally never eat bats. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao. Arr. Rum in the coffee, mate. That's the secret. <laughs>